Everyone needs compassion, love that's never failing. Let mercy fall on me. Everyone needs forgiveness, the kindness of the Savior, the hope of the nations. Savior, He can move the mountains. He God is mighty to save. He is mighty to save forever author of salvation he rose and conquered the grave jesus conquered the grave so take me as you find me all my fears and failures fill my life again i live my life to follow everything I believe in now I surrender Savior he can move the mountains my God is mighty to save he is mighty to save forever author of salvation he rose and conquered the grave jesus conquered the grave shine your light and let the whole world see we're singing for the glory of the risen king jesus shine your light and let the whole world see we're singing for the glory of the risen king savior he can move the mountains my god is mighty to save he is mighty to save forever author of salvation he rose and conquered the grave jesus conquered the grave Savior, He can move the mountains. My God is mighty to save. He is mighty to save forever. Author of salvation, He rose and conquered the grave. Jesus conquered the grave. Shine your light and let the whole world see. We're singing for the glory of the risen King. Jesus, shine your light and let the whole world see. We're singing for the glory of the risen King. Good morning. We're in 1 Timothy 1, 1 through 17 today. Paul, an apostle of Jesus Christ, by the commandment of God our Savior and Lord Jesus Christ, our hope, to Timothy, a true son in the faith, grace, mercy, and peace from God our Father and Jesus Christ our Lord. As I urged you when I went into Macedonia, remain in Ephesus that you may charge some that they teach no other doctrine nor give heed to fables and endless genealogies, which call, causes disputes rather than godly edification, which is in faith. Now the purpose of the commandment is love from a pure heart, from a good conscience, and from sincere faith, from which some, having strayed, have turned aside to idle talk. Desiring to be teachers of the law, understanding neither what they say nor the things which they affirm, but we know that the law is good if one uses it lawfully, knowing this, that the law is not made for a righteous person, but for the lawless and insubordinate, for the ungodly and for sinners, for the unholy and profane, for murderers of fathers and murderers of mothers, for manslayers, for fornicators, 
for sodomites, for kidnappers, for liars, for perjurers, and if there is any other that is contrary to sound doctrine, according to the glorious gospel of the blessed God, which was committed to my trust. And I thank Jesus Christ, our Lord, who has enabled me because he counted me faithful, putting me into the ministry. Although I was formerly a blasphemer, a persecutor, and an insolent man, but I obtained mercy because I did it ignorantly in unbelief. And the grace of our Lord was exceedingly abundant with faith and love which are in Christ Jesus. This is a faithful saying and worthy of all acceptance, that Christ Jesus came into the world to save sinners, of whom I am chief. However, for this reason I obtain mercy, that in me first Jesus Christ might show all long suffering, as a pattern to those who are going to believe on him for everlasting life. Now to the King eternal, immortal, invisible, to God who alone is wise, be honor and glory forever and ever. Amen. Thank you, Mike. We have been talking about false doctrine when we were in the other book just before us. And now we're going to get into talking about teachers of the law. And so let's kind of get into that word as we look into it and give you an idea of what we're talking about. So let's go to the Lord in prayer. Father, we do thank you, Lord, as we look into the letters to Timothy from Paul, Lord. We just ask for uh, help us to understand what he's talking about and most of all, help us to understand the importance of the law. In Jesus' name, amen. Okay, here's some laws that are in Idaho. How are you familiar with some of these laws that are in Idaho? It is against the law to live in a doghouse or kennel unless you're a dog. Okay. Huh? So when we get put in the doghouse, Joe, remember, it's a figure of speech because we're not legally allowed to be in there. You know that, right? So in Idaho Falls, it is legal to ride a motorcycle if you're over 88. Did you know that? And in Idaho Falls, if you, if, don't you dare think about riding a merry-go-round on a Sunday. It's against the law. Did you know that? These are just a few of the ones in Idaho in Tamarack, you know where Tamarack is? It's a little town up by council. It is illegal to buy onions after dark without a permit. And you also can't sell chickens after sundown without permission from the sheriff. So remember that next time. I wonder if it means the little grocery store can't sell chickens after dark. I have to find out. Hunting with the remote using the internet is punishable by law. And it's also forbidden to hunt from a helicopter, whether it's in the air or not. And, of course, that's true for airplanes, too, isn't it? How about this one? Selling an Idaho deluxe potato with rot, blemish, or sun damage can get you sent to jail for up to six months. That's on the books. In Polk Teller, you're required by law to smile. What does that mean? That means you can't say anything bad about the city of Pocatello. If you do, they can throw you in jail. Public displays of affection in Idaho are limited to under 18 minutes. Did you know that? <laughs> so keep that in check, fathers and mothers. When you see your daughter or somebody out there, turn the clock on and time them, right? In Eagle, it is illegal to sweep dirt from one's house into the street. The state of Idaho forbids you from fishing off the back of a camel. Did you know that? But before you search for a different mammal to fish from the back of, know that giraffes are off limits too. And according to Mayhem, section of Idaho code, cannibalism is also illegal unless it is necessary to survive. And do you realize Idaho is the only state in the Union that has a cannibalism law? Isn't that interesting? 
None of the others have a cannibalism law. So those are just a few of the crazy laws that are in Idaho. And I'm sure we could have found a whole lot more. Those are just a few of them. So let's get into our word today and let's talk about the law and what it's talking about. We're going to start at verse 3. And it says, And I urge you when I went into Macedonia, remain in Ephesus. Who is this? This is Paul writing a letter to Timothy. Uh, at the time when they went through there, they had some troubles that were going on in Ephesus. So Paul had encouraged Timothy to stay there. It says that you may charge some that they teach no other doctrine, nor give heed to fables and endless genealogies, which cause disputes rather than godly edification, which is in faith. So just a little history background, it says after 15 years, about 15 years after Paul planted the church in Ephesus, some elders who wanted to style themselves after teachers of the law in Jewish synagogues were teaching myths and endless genealogies. So what are the things that you learn in the Jewish synagogue? How far can you go on the Sabbath, right? Those are things that you could be teaching if you wanted to. Uh, what you can eat, the Catholic Church, remember, used to teach that you could only eat fish on what day of the week? Friday, Friday right? Well, maybe this is what was going up there. This led to speculation was causing misunderstanding and confusion among the people of God. The false teachers had a complete misunderstanding of the law of God. So Paul urged Timothy to remain at Ephesus to correct the false doctrine that was being taught. So like we said, what are some of the false doctrines we have talked about in the past? The doctrine of works, right? Where we taught that you had to do works to be saved. Or the doctrine of baptism. Or maybe the doctrine of circumcision. All of those are false doctrines. That maybe they were teaching those at the time. And Timothy was instructed to straighten them out on that. Verse 5 gives us a clue of what they should have been teaching. It says, now the purpose of the commandment is love from a pure heart, from a good conscience, and from sincere faith. This is what he should have been teaching. We've taught what is the great commandments that Jesus gave to us. Only two, right, that he gave to us. If you follow those, he says you follow them all. You know, love the Lord thy God with all your heart, with all your soul, and your neighbor as yourself, right? If you do those two, he says you'll fulfill them all and do the rest of them. Well, do you, have you ever read the book, Lord of the Flies? Pretty gross book, isn't it? You know, this book is about a bunch of British boys. England was at war at the time, so they took these young boys, put them on an airplane, hoping to send them somewhere else. But in the process of this plane load of boys, they get attacked, and the plane goes down and crashes near a desert island. Or I shouldn't say desert island, near an island. It had stuff on it, right? And these boys are trying to figure out how to govern themselves. And as you read through the story, we find out that there's a boy named Ralph and a boy named Jack, if I remember right. These two boys are the ones who are be made leaders of the group. Ralph is the one who wants to keep peace, you know. Jack is the one who's the hunter. He's the aggressive one. And as we read through the story, we see how they try to govern each other and the conflicts that happen. And in the end, what do you think, boys 6 to 13 years old, how do you think their governing is going to work out for them? Not very good, did it? fact is... One of the boys got killed. They killed one boy in their fears. One boy fell off a cliff when a rock rolled on him when they were fighting. So battles happen, and all this is over a confusion of how do you rule people and how do you do justice. And they found out they couldn't do it as young people. It takes somebody older and mature to do that for them. So if you ever get a chance, read that book. It's a gruesome book. It's not a very good book. But what happened is the author of that book was a general in the war. 
And what really disappointed him is he watched show soldiers do this cruel stuff to the enemy. You know, torture them, all this other stuff. And he couldn't understand why. Sure, war is a battle, but you don't have to do all the extra cruel stuff that they were doing. And this is what forced him. He got so bad, he finally resigned. But he wrote this book in 1954 because of that, to try to help understand what was going on. It says this, verse 6, from which some have strayed, in other words, the original message, what we talked in verse 5, have turned aside to idle talk, desiring to be teachers of the law, understanding neither what they say nor the things which they affirm. In other words, they're trying to take the Jewish traditions and put them in the Christian community, and they don't really understand what they're doing. It's not the purpose of what God had in store for us, is it? It says here, they were most likely elders in the church since they were the ones doing the teaching. They, these certain persons desired to be teachers of the law. They apparently wanted to have a role in the Christian church, something equivalent to the role of their Jewish teachers had in a Jewish community. The fact they did not understand either what they are saying or the things which they had made confident assertions suggests that they were not qualified to teach. They were not able to discern their own errors. Have you ever heard of the book of Jubilees? You know, sometimes we don't realize the Bible refers to a lot of different books in it. They're lost books, most of them. But the book of Jubilees, also called the Lesser Genesis, if you were to read it, is an ancient writing that claims to be revelation given to Moses regarding the vi division of the days, weeks, months, and jubilees of the law. This is Jewish system. Remember, jubilee in the Jewish system was every 50 years. Remember that? On the 50th year, you gave back everything. If you had a slave... Your, that slave was freed. If you had bought land from somebody, that land went back to the original owner. Every 50 years, that was Jewish law. The purpose was always to keep the land in the hands of the original people through this process. That may be one of the things they were trying to teach the Christians to do. We don't know. These jubilees are considered 49-year periods of time in which all the world history is divided. And they figure it was dated or written around 135 and 105 B.C., sometime in that period through there. So this is what some commentators believe may have been what the teaching was at that time. They're not sure. Have you ever heard of the book of Enoch? The book of Enoch says is a religious text ascribed by traditional by tradition to Enoch, the great-grandfather of Noah. So if we actually had this book, you can actually buy the book online, or a version of it, I should say. Enoch contains unique material on the origin of the demons and Nephilim. Nephilims are big people. Why some angels fell from heaven, an explanation of why the Genesis flood was morally necessary, and prophetic exposition of the thousand-year reign of the Messiah. Why is it not in the Bible? Well, some of the Catholic Bibles, this is in it, isn't it? This book of Enoch shows up in it. Here's another example. Do you know there are 22 other books listed in the Bible that we never read, study or read because they're considered lost? They're not important. They probably do not focus on salvation in Christ. But this book here, Numbers 21 says, Therefore is said in the book of the wars of the Lord, Waha and Shafa, the brooks of the Armon, and the slope of the brooks that reaches to the dwell of Ar and lies on the border of Moab. So, anybody ever read that book? How about this one? Then, this is Joshua chapter 10. It says, Then Joshua spoke to the Lord in a day when the Lord delivered up the Amorites before the children of Israel, and he said in the sight of Israel, Sun, sit still over Gibeon, and moon in the valley of Aladon. 
So the sun stood still and the moon stopped till the people had revenge upon their enemies. Now we read this in the Bible. This is the story we talk about where the sun set still for 24 hours for them to conquer. And it goes on and says, Is it not written in the book of Jasher? So the sun stood still in the midst of heaven and did not hasten to go down for about a whole day. Where's the book of Jasher at? How about this? First Samuel talks about manner of the kingdom. There's another book that we don't know about. Our Acts of Solomon. Chronicles of the kings of Israel. Chronicles of the kings of Judah. Books of the kings of Israel. All these are in the Bible as reference points that they say you can go to. Annals of King David. Books of Nathan the prophet. History of Nathan the prophet. Story of the prophet Ida. Book of Shema, Shemaiah the prophet. And book of Jehu. Why are they not found in the Bible? These are all references that the Bible talks about. It says the origin of the Bible is who? It's God, isn't it? He's the one who inspired the writings. It is a historical book that is backed by archaeology. And we find that every day where they find more evidence to prove that the Bible is true word for word. And a prophetic book that has lived up to all of its claims thus far. The Bible is God's letter to humanity collected in 66 books written by 40 individually inspired writers over a period of 1,600 years. The claim of divine inspiration may seem dramatic or unrealistic to some, but a careful and honest study of the biblical scriptures will show them to be true. Powerfully, the Bible validates its divine authorship through pro fulfilled prophecies. An astonishing 668 prophecies had been, have been fulfilled and none have ever been proven false. They say three are unconfirmed. Well, what three are they talking about? The tribulation, the rapture, those things haven't been completed yet, right? But these books probably were not God-inspired, were they? They were history books that had been written to record the events of the day. That's why they were never put in the Bible. Now, in the Old Testament, if you were back in Jewish time and you wanted to read the Old Testament, how would you read the Old Testament? You would go pull out the scroll, wouldn't it? The scroll of Moses. Or you'd go pull out the Daniel. All of them would be written in scrolls. It wasn't until later in history that they were combined and put in a book that we call the Bible today. Before that, they were all individual letters and scrolls that they had. It says, there are more than 14,000 Old Testament manuscripts and fragments copied throughout the Middle East, Mediterranean, and European regions that agree dramatically with each other. In addition, these texts agree with the Septuagint version of the Old Testament, which was translated from Hebrew to Greek sometime during the 3rd century B.C. The Dead Sea Scrolls, discovered in Israel in the 1940s and 50s, also provide phenomenal evidence for the reliability of the ancient transcript of the Jewish scriptures, Old Testament, before the arrival of Jesus Christ. The Hebrew scribes who copied the Jewish scriptures dedicated their lives to preserving the accuracy of the holy books, Look what it says here. These scribes went to phenomenal lengths to ensure manuscript reliability. They were highly trained and meticulously observed, counting every letter, word, and paragraph against master scrolls. A single error. Can you imagine writing one of those whole things out and at the end of it make one mistake and that thing would be thrown away? It wasn't thrown away. It was destroyed so that it couldn't accidentally be put and found later. That's how accurate the Word of God has been throughout this time. How about the New Testament? It says evidence of the New Testament is also dramatic, with over 5,300 known copies and fragments in the original Greek, nearly 800 of which were copied about 1,000 A.D. So what is this? This is recent in time. These were, this is not thousands of years later. Some manuscript tests date to the early 2nd and 3rd centuries with the time between the original autographs and our earliest existing copies 
being a remarkable short 60 years. So we don't have a long time between the original and the copy. This is fantastic. You know, look at these comparisons, like Julius Caesar and the Gilead Wars. Ten manuscripts remain with the earliest one dating 1,000 years after the original. And they call those accurate, don't they? A thousand years later, they made a copy. And he goes on and lists some others there that tell you. So we know the accuracy of the Bible is very accurate. We know the accuracy and the reliability of the New Testament is very accurate. So let's go on here. Verse 8 says, But we know that the law is good if one uses it lawfully. What does that mean? The law is good if one uses it lawfully. Have we ever had laws? We've had laws since the beginning of time. What was the first law that God gave Adam? What did he say? Of every tree of the garden you may eat freely, but of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil you shall not eat, for in the day that you eat it you shall surely die. We only had one law back then, wasn't it? And we couldn't even keep one law. You know? So are laws good? Do we have laws today? Of course we have laws today. This is what John Calvin says. John Calvin says the law has three uses. First, the law is punitive. Is that it condemns sinners and drives them to Christ. That's what laws do. It makes them look towards the good, doesn't it? An unbeliever comes under conviction of sin and sees how he has broken God's law. He cries out to Christ for forgiveness. Second, the law is a deterrent in that it restrains evildoers. This applies to all people and is best seen when driving down the highway and you see flashing blue and red lights. When you drive down the highway, what's the first thing you do when you see flashing blue and red lights in front of you? You do what? You look at your speedometer. You automatically take your foot off the gas pedal, don't you? 99% of the time. Whether you are breaking the law or not, it don't matter. It's, it's just what you do. You know? It's because we know that there's a law that says we dare. Not supposed to do that. And third, the law is educative in that it teaches and guides believers. A believer has received forgiveness for his sin. He wants to know how to please and honor and serve God. And so the law now teaches and guides him. Does not the law teach us like the Ten Commandments? We're not supposed to murder and do these. And yet, people do it, don't they? And then verse 9 says, And knowing this, that the law is not made for the righteous person. What does it mean the law is not made for the righteous person? You would think that's what the law is made for, wasn't it? But well, let me give you an example of what I'm talking about on that. Have you ever known a guy who thinks he's good? He's a good guy. All the time, you know, he, he always does the right things. And you talk to him about Jesus Christ, and what does he say? I don't need him. I'm doing the right things. I'm doing everything right. I'm not sinning. I do, you know. These are what they call righteous people. They think they are righteous. They think they can get to heaven based upon their works or their good deeds or something. They don't think they need Christ. Luke 5, 31 says, Jesus answered and said to them, Those who are well have no need of a physician, but those who are sick. I have not come to call the righteous, but sinners to repentance. So it says people are who are well do not think they need a doctor, and people who are righteous feel they don't need a savior. That's how it is with these people. They don't realize their sin that they did. But he goes on and he says this, but these are the people that realize they need the law. 
but for the lawless and insubordinate, for the ungodly and for sinners, and the list goes on and on. Talking about all these different people. They're the ones who need to know Christ as their Savior. They're the ones who are not going to qualify if they wanted to be righteous people. They need Christ in their lives. Acts 8 tells us this. This is Paul. Of course, we knew him as Saul prior to before he became saved. And his name was changed to Paul. And Saul was consenting to his death. Whose death? Stephen's death. Stephen, a, all he was was a deacon. All he was doing was sharing the message to others. He got called in in front of the, the what? The priests. And what did they do? They didn't like the words what he said. It says, at that time, a great persecution arose against the church, which was of Jerusalem, and they were all scattered throughout the regions of Judea and Samaria, except the apostles. And devout men carried Stephen to his burial and made great lamination over him. As for Saul, remember, here's Saul. Here's the one that we're reading the writings of Paul right now, or Saul. As for Saul, he made havoc of the church, entering every house and dragging off men and women, committing them to prison. Maybe what they should add, men, women, and children. To that list, dragging them all off simply because they, he didn't agree with what they believed. Then Paul, Acts 9, says this, Then Paul, still breathing threats and murder against the disciples of the Lord. This guy is quite, uh, how do you want to say it? Aggressive, isn't he? You know, he's, he's out to get them. Went to the high priest and asked letters from him to the synagogues of Damascus, so that if he found any who were of the way, Christians, whether men or women, they might bring them bound to Jerusalem and put them in prison also. Isn't it? But this is what Paul says. And Paul says, And I thank Jesus Christ our Lord, who has enabled me because he counted me faithful, putting me into the ministry. Of all people, you wouldn't have put Paul as being the one to be in the ministry. You would have probably said he's one of those lost souls. Although I was formerly a blasphemer, a persecutor, and an insolent man, but I obtained mercy because I did it ignorantly in unbelief. And the grace of our Lord was exceedingly abundant with faith and love which are in Christ Jesus. This is a faithful saying and worthy of all accepted, that Jesus Christ came into the world to save sinners. What did he say? I did not come into the world to save the world, but that the world through me might be saved, of whom I am chief. However, for this reason I obtained mercy, that in me first Jesus Christ might show all suffer long suffering. As a pattern of those who are going to believe on him for everlasting life. Now to the king eternal, immortal, invisible to God, who alone is wise, be honor and glory forever and ever. Amen. What did he say? I was a sinner who needed Christ. And I was one of the worst sinners of the bunch. When you read through that list. He qualified in many categories there. That's why we can say to prisoners who are in prison who have committed murder and all the other crimes that you can still come to the Lord Jesus Christ because he wants your soul. He wants you to be with him. How heard of Tom Brady? Everybody know who Tom Brady is? Of course you do, you know. He's the greatest of all time of all football quarterbacks says he's not only talented, but also disciplined in his preparation. Apparently, Brady is extremely disciplined about what he eats. His diet is designed to give him maximum performance. The fact that he is 44 years old and is still one of the greatest quarterbacks in the league says something about his preparation. Now, if I remember right, it wasn't that too long ago they asked him, you're 44, why are you still doing this? 
What was his response? I want to play with my son. His son is coming up in football, and he hopes to be able to play a national tournament with his son. Now, isn't that exciting? He has a goal and a purpose there. Uh, in the spiritual realm, reading and studying the Word of God is like eating food in the physical realm. Many, if not all, Christians want to be spiritual. Tom Br want to be spiritual, Tom Brady's, but do not put in any time reading and obeying God's Word. They may attend worship service diligently, and if there is any reading God's Word in the service, they may be the only time they crack open their Bible that week. If you want to grow in healthy doctrine, we need to spend far more time than what we do in reading and studying God's Word. If you want to be a Tom Brady, you have to do the work. Just like we study today. There were teachers who wanted to teach doctrine. They wanted to get up and be teachers in front of the group. But they didn't take the time to understand the true message of Jesus Christ. They were so used to the law. So as we go forth today, let us all be, well, shall we say, Tom Brady's? Let us read God's word. Let us grow, because we are looking at a world today that is changing daily. The battle between Russia and Ukraine was going to spread further and further as we've seen all these other countries around it start putting on sanction and restrictions and, and concerns. It will affect us in one way or another. But we trust God because his word tells us we know the end of the story. Father, we thank you, Lord. We thank you for the prophecies you've given us. We thank you for your word, and it tells us exactly what we can expect to happen, and we can see it coming together a piece at a time. Like it said, you told us that we will know this time and the seasons. We just will not know the exact day or, or any of that. But your word's been open, and it shows that we're in those seasons. So, Lord, we just pray that our hearts and minds are prepared to know more about you. As we go forth this Sunday, let us be faithful. In Jesus' name, amen. I am thine, O Lord, I have heard thy voice, and it told thy love to me. For I long to rise in the arms of faith, and to be closer drawn to thee. Draw me nearer, near, blessed Lord, to the cross where thou hast died. Draw me nearer, 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 blessed Lord, to thy precious bleeding side. Consecrate me now to thy service, Lord, by thy power of grace divine. Let my soul look up with the steadfast hope, and thy will be lost in thine. Draw me nearer, 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 blessed Lord, to the cross where thou hast died. 
draw me nearer, 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 blessed Lord, to thy precious bleeding side. Oh, the pure delight of a single hour that before thy throne I spend. When I kneel in prayer and with thee, my God, I commune as friend with friend. Draw me nearer, 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 blessed Lord, to the cross where thou hast died. Draw me nearer, 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 blessed Lord, to thy precious bleeding side. There are depths of love that I cannot know till I cross the narrow sea. There are heights of joy that I may not reach till I rest in peace with thee. Draw me nearer, near, near, blessed Lord, to the cross where thou hast died. Draw me near, 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 blessed Lord, to thy precious bleeding side. Dear Lord, thank you. Thank you for the gift you gave us of eternal life. Thank you for your word that we can study each day. Keep it in our hearts, Lord, we pray. In Jesus' name, amen.